Now, I want you to picture that because that is the scene here in 2 Samuel chapter 6. That's what's going on. You see, sometime before this, Israel's enemy, the Philistines, they had taken the holy Ark of the Covenant in battle. And after just seven months, they became very eager to return it. (laughs) And that's because the hand of the Lord was against them, amen? The hand of God was against the enemies of the people of God because sickness plagued them wherever they took the ark. So they returned it. And then it was stored in the house of a man named Abinadab until, until the day that David brought it back to Jerusalem. And that's where we're picking it up this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3. Are you all there? It says, They loaded the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart. They brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab on the hill. And Ahio was walking in front of the ark. Meanwhile, David and the entire house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all sorts of instruments made of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And so what we have here is not just a parade. Listen, this is a massive, mobile praise and worship service like never before. And that's because, like I said, the ark of of God, the, the symbol of God's divine presence was there with them. And so this was a time for celebration. This was a time for shouting and praising and, and, and dancing. You see, this was a tremendously victorious celebration. That is, until things went terribly wrong. You see, suddenly the ox cart that the ark was on, it began to teeter a little bit and it began to be unsteady and, well, that's when it happened. That's when this long praise parade came to a screeching, grinding halt. Look at verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord became angry against Uzzah, and God struck him down on the spot for his irreverence. He died there beside the ark of God. Now, how many of you know there's nothing quite like the wrath of Almighty God? to put a stop to the celebrations of man. I mean, the people living in Noah's day, they experienced that, didn't they? Jesus said they were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah went into the ark and then the flood came and destroyed them all. In Noah's day, their their celebration of sin, it came to a screeching halt when the wrath of God was revealed from heaven. And, and, And listen, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is coming again. Get ready. Ready or not, he is coming again. And when he does, make no mistake, he will bring an end to the celebration of sin. But that's not what they were celebrating here, of course. But it does show us something. You see, uh, Noah's ark, which was a boat, and the ark of the covenant, which was a box, they they both tell us something. They both tell us that, that, listen, God is not someone to trifle with. When God's wrath is kindled, you need to know that judgment is not too far behind. Now, when most people read this account about Uzzah uh, uh, being struck dead by God for for steadying the ark, usually their first reaction to that is, is the question, why? I mean, why was God so upset in the first place? Why was he wrathful about that? Uh, what, What did Uzzah do? What crime did he commit that was deserving of death? 
We, we wonder about that. And we say things, you know, his only crime was that he tried to stop the ark of God from, from falling to the ground. And that's true, right? He, I mean, he did try to stop it from falling. But what many of us fail to understand is that this celebration, this praise parade was doomed from the very start. It was destined to end the way it did. Why? Because of Exodus 25 and Numbers 4. That's why. You see, in Exodus 25, 14, God said this. He said, you shall put poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. You see, God had made it very clear that the ark was to be carried by poles. It was not to be put on a cart. Numbers 4.15 says that the sons of Koath, they were the ones to carry the ark. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. You see, Israel was given specific instructions by God how the ark was to be transported, how they were to carry it, who was to carry it. He had made it abundantly clear that his holy things, which included the ark of God, were not to be touched by human hands ever. God's holy things were not to be touched by unholy human hands. So what we need to understand is that Uzzah did sin. Uzzah sinned in disobedience to God and he died on the spot because he assumed that he could touch God's holy thing with his unholy hands and not suffer any consequence for it. You see, Uzzah's fatal error was assuming that his hands were cleaner than the ground was. And that's our problem too. That's what it boils down to. He assumed that his hands were cleaner than the ground and we make the same kinds of assumptions. You see, and that's because we cannot really comprehend just how defiled we really are when compared to the holiness of God. The prophet Isaiah, he declares our problem And he says that we're all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to God's holiness. Psalm 24 says, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Uzzah should have known better. Because God told his people that holy things were to be approached with the utmost reverence and seriousness. And they were to be handled exactly as God had commanded them. And that's because holy things were dangerous things. Holy things were dangerous things. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, the ark was taken to a a town called Beth Beth Shemesh. And God killed 50,000 men just for looking into it. They didn't even touch it. They just looked into it with their eyes and God struck them dead. Turn with me to the book of Leviticus. I know it's your favorite. The book of Leviticus chapter 10. I've been spending quite a bit of time in this book. Leviticus chapter 10. Are you all there? Verse 1 says this. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Now who was Aaron? Somebody tell me who Aaron was. He was the high priest, right? He was Moses' brother. And we're told here that his two sons in verse 1 they each took a censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he did not command them to do. 
Then a fire came out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. God struck them dead. Why? Because they did not take their service to a holy God seriously. Because they were irreverent in their behavior and they used strange fire that he told them not to use in his presence. And listen, here's the, here's the, the thing. These are Aaron's sons. This is the, the sons of the high priest. These are Moses' nephews and not even them are con- exempt from the wrath of a dangerously holy God. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they were both struck dead by God for lying to the Holy Spirit about their giving. Now, now listen, if you think that God was too harsh with Uzzah, you think he was too harsh with the men of Beth Shemesh, too harsh with Nadab and Abihu and Ananias and Sapphira, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, I think God ought to just lighten up a little, then that just means you really don't understand the holiness of God. It means that you don't understand that every single one of God's judgments, listen, they're not divine temper tantrums. God doesn't lose his temper. God never loses self-control. These aren't divine temper tantrums. These are righteous reactions of the holiness of God. And God made it clear that holy things are different than ordinary things. They're set apart. They're not to be taken for granted. So to dismiss or misuse God's holy things, it was the equivalent of committing blasphemy in his presence. Because listen, holiness, get this, holiness isn't just one attribute of God. What I mean is holiness is not just one part of who God is. No, holiness is God. For God is holy, holy, holy. Somebody shout the name of Jesus. Come on. R.C. Sproul pointed out that there's only one attribute of God that's ever raised to the third degree of repetition in Scripture. The Bible doesn't simply say that God is holy or even that he's holy, holy, but that he is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is mercy, 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 or, or, or love, 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 or justice, 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 or wrath, wrath, wrath. No, he, the Bible says he is holy, holy, holy. This is a dimension of God that consumes his very essence. And so God's holy things, listen, they weren't the same as common things. They weren't to be treated like common things or handled like common things. They're not to be approached casually. They're not something to to make a joke about or, or a mockery of. Because looking upon or improperly touching God's holy things came at a very high price. And often that price was death. Holy things were dangerous things. The first time the word holy is used in the Bible is in Exodus 3, 5 when when Moses stood before the burning bush and he was told to take the sandals off his feet. Why? Because the ground he was standing on was what? Holy. Holy ground. Why was it holy ground? It was holy ground because the holy God was there. In the same way, the Ark of the Covenant, it it represented God's divine presence. And the mercy seat on the Ark, it represented God's very throne. And so for Uzzah to touch the Ark, listen to me, it was the equivalent of, of attempting to touch God himself with unholy hands. 
And the Bible says that no man can look upon God and live, let alone touch God and live. When the prophet Isaiah, he saw, he saw the, the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up, a seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The, the Bible tells us that Isaiah was in fear for his life. And he said, woe is me for I am undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. Isaiah feared God because he knew he was unclean. He was a man of unclean lips. But for us, for us often out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And, and we like to think of the king, the Lord of hosts, as somebody, you know, like our, our, like our college roommate who's going to back us up and, 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 and go along with us no matter what we say or do. He's like a BFF that's going to support you no matter what. And we totally forget that he's dangerously holy. And we totally forget that he can strike you dead just for touching his things or for lying to him, or even looking at him. We must never forget that the Lord is a holy God with the power of life and death in his hands, and he can utterly destroy us. And listen, when your sin, listen, when your sin collides with his holiness... Oh man, you cannot help but to cry out with Isaiah and say, woe is me, for I am undone. That's why the people in Revelation chapter six, they beg for the mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. You see, they had a fear of the Lord because they finally understand that he is dangerously holy. In my library, I have a book written by A.W. Tozer called Knowledge of the Holy. And Tozer said there was just one verse in the Bible that, that prompted him to write this book. And that verse is found in Proverbs chapter 9. Would you turn there? Proverbs chapter 9. Let me know when you're there, please. Amen. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, I hear pages still turning. I'm going to wait just a moment for you all to get there. You there? Okay, you need to see this. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You need to understand that this word fear here doesn't only mean reverence or respect. It can mean that. But it also can mean dreadful and exceedingly fearful. And what the Bible tells us here is that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You see, Isaiah, he was wise enough to fear the Lord. Isaiah understood the fear of the Lord. And listen, fearing God it is the starting point, we're told. It's the starting point of all wisdom. Because, listen, if you don't have a fear of God, then you're unwise. You're a fool. And all around us, there are unwise fools everywhere. People who fear everything but God. They, they, they fear the economy collapsing. They fear the government. They, 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 they fear strangers or being victims of crime. You see, people all around us, they seem to fear everyone and everything except the one they should truly fear, the Holy One. Jesus said, fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. 
but rather fear him which is able to destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. Listen, I want you to know that it really is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It really is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord really is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 9.10 is what we call a parallelism. It's a, it's a figure of speech we often see in the Bible. It's, it's when, when a verse in the Bible is repeating itself, saying the same thing twice, but in a different way. So look at it again. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, that's the first part. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's the second part of the verse. So here in verse 10, the fear of God and the knowledge of the holy, listen to me, follow me, are both referring to the same thing. So get this. What we're being told here in the word of God is the God whom we should be wise enough to fear is also the one that we should have a knowledge of as the holy. He's the holy. He's the holy one we should both know and fear. Come on. Are you guys still with me? Have I chased, it, chased you out of here yet? Good. In his book, Tozer says this. He says this, listen. Until we have seen ourselves as God sees us, we are not likely to be much disturbed over conditions around us as long as they do not get so far out of hand as to threaten our comfortable way of life. We have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. In other words, unholiness is common. But listen, God's not common. He's holy. He, he, he's perfectly pure. He's without spot or blemish. He's morally perfect. He's separate from all that is common, separate from the impure, separate from the corrupt, separate from the immoral. And guess what? That means he's separate from sinful human beings. You see, in the old covenant, the holy was off limits, unapproachable, untouchable by the unholy, by people, by sinners, which we all are. In Exodus 19, we're told that the border of Mount Sinai was off limits to the Israelites, and if they transgressed that border, they would die. Why? Because the presence of the holy was on that mountain. And by definition, the holy had to be kept separate from the common, separate from the defiled, separate from the unclean and sinful. Likewise, when they traveled in the wilderness, when they set up the tabernacle, we're told the Levites, they encamped around the tabernacle. They did that to keep people out. They did that to serve as a barrier between themselves and the holiness of God. You see, it was a protection of unholy people. It was for their protection because, because God was a dangerously holy God. In the tabernacle and then later on in the temple, we know that the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, was off limits to all those who came to worship God. And only the high priest, only the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies and then only after a strict obedience to God's commands and then only once a year. In Exodus 28, it tells us that the high priest was to have bells on the hem of his garment. And so while he was in the Holy of Holies, the sound of the bells, it could be heard. And listen, as long as the people could hear the sound of those bells, guess what? They knew he was still alive. They knew that he hadn't been struck dead by the holy. And some people say they would even tie a rope around his leg. Just in case. Just in case he was struck dead they could pull him out because guess what? They knew they weren't going in after him. Why? Because the holy of holies was present in that holy place and he couldn't be approached by just anybody in any way. Listen, what I want you to get this morning, I really want you to get this, that the, the God of the Old Testament, the holy God 
of the Old Testament was dangerously holy. And that's why he was off limits, unapproachable, untouchable by the common person. No one could see God or touch God and live. Now, with all that backdrop, I want you to turn in your New Testament to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And this passage, of course, is the passage that's usually read around Christmas time because this is where the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. And we're going to pick it up in verse 34 and see what her reaction was to that news. Are you there? Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Then the angel, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have not known a man? The angel said to her, the holy, say the holy, the holy Holy spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the holy, say the holy, the holy holy one who will be born will be called the son of God. Now stop right there. You see, Mary, she's told that the Holy Ghost was going to rest upon her, that God's power was going to overshadow her. And this word overshadow, it's an interesting one because it literally means to be engulfed in a haze of brilliancy to invest with preternatural influence. Preternatural, it means something that surpasses the common or the ordinary. So this overshadowing of the Holy Ghost was going to accomplish something, listen, that went far beyond the common or the ordinary. You see, the Holy Ghost was going to do something that was very uncommon and very holy. And listen, I'm not just talking about the virgin birth either, as miraculous as that was. So with that in mind, look at verse 35 again. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who will be born will be called the Son of God. Do you see what I see there? Do you see what the angel, how the angel refers to Jesus? refers to him as the Holy One. Now, I actually like how the King James translates this. The King James, stay with me, says this, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing, come on, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Listen, the, the, the holy of the Old Testament became the holy one in the New Testament because the Holy Ghost did a holy thing and God became flesh and he dwelt among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can we really understand what that means? Can we really grasp the implications of this? With the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the inaccessible, unapproachable, untouchable, the dangerously holy God for the first time became accessible, became approachable, became touchable. Come on. And for the very first time since the beginning, he removed the danger. He removed the danger of a dangerously holy God for an unholy people. The Apostle John, he marvels at this reality in 1 John chapter 1 when he says, that which was from the beginning, listen, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have touched the word concerning the word of life. Do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying, listen, I've seen the holy. I have looked upon the holy God with my own eyes. I've even touched him. I've touched the holy one. And guess what? I'm alive today to tell you about it. Peter understood this. He came to an understanding in, in, in Luke 5, 8, when, Jesus saw, when, when Peter saw Jesus' power over, over nature itself, he realized who Jesus was. When he came face to face with the holy, what did Peter do? 
He fell down at the feet of Jesus and he cried out like Isaiah did and he said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Why did he say that? Because he was in fear for his life. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Peter understood the consequences better than we do, I think. He understood the consequences of the unholy being in the presence of the holy. And he understood better than we do that holy things were dangerous things. In Mark chapter 5, there was a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, and in her society, she's considered defiled, unclean, untouchable. She can't be touched, and she can't touch others. But the Gospels tells us that she reached out, and she dared to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. And when she did, Jesus turned and said, who touched me? And when he saw the woman who had touched him, what did that holy thing do? What did he do to that unclean, defiled woman? Did he strike her dead on the spot? No. He said, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Listen, I I don't think it's an accident that so many times Jesus used touch as a way to show us that God had drawn near. He used touch to show us that he was, God was now approachable and touchable. In Luke 5, 12, it says this, when he was in a certain city, a man full of leprosy, upon seeing Jesus, fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Come on, come on, man. Jesus still does this today. Come on, Jesus still touches the unclean. And and guess what? When, when, When he touched that unclean man, guess what? He didn't become unclean. The man became clean. He wasn't struck dead. He was made new. You see, that's because when Jesus came, he reversed everything, didn't he? The leprous man was the definition of unclean. The woman with an issue of blood was the definition of unclean. And yet just one touch from Jesus, come on, one touch from Jesus reversed their entire condition and made them clean. This is what makes Jesus so amazing. This is why you need Jesus Christ. Jesus touches the unclean and he makes them clean. Jesus touches the unholy and he makes them holy. Jesus touches lepers. He touches women with an issue of blood. Jesus gives life to the dead. Jesus is the one who heals us and cleanses us from all our defilements. And yet he never becomes defiled himself. Jesus reversed the curse. Jesus erases our sin. And Jesus, listen, (laughs) He removed the danger of approaching and touching the holy. Are you starting to understand what it meant for God to appear as the Holy One, Jesus? You see, there's this great contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament, isn't there? So much so that some people think that there's two different gods being spoken of, and that's not the case. You see, in the, con- the contrast is in the Old Testament, the holy God himself was dangerously holy. He was unapproachable, untouchable by sinful, defiled human beings. And again, our problem is we can't comprehend just how defiled we really are. And therefore, we can't even comprehend the amount of danger we're really in. But we are. We are in danger because we are defiled. Because we have sinned against God repeatedly and against other people repeatedly. And no matter how hard we try to serve God or, or, or try to be holy on our own, we still fall so terribly short 
of his righteousness. But the New Testament, the good news is that God came near. God became a human being. The holy came near. He came to us. Why? So that we might be able to touch him. And we might be able to come to him. And he might be able to touch us as well. As J. Vernon McGee once said, he said, Jesus reached out and grabbed man by the hand. And with the other, he grabbed God by the hand. And he brought the two together. What that means is that Jesus lowered himself. He stooped down, reaching out to sinners, pulling us up, drawing us up to the Father, even if it meant trading places with us on the cross. Even if it meant paying the price for our sin himself. Listen, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And I want you to understand that Jesus paid the price from your sin. He died in your place so that you could have eternal life. So the Bible declares that we need to flee. There is a danger still, and it's called the wrath to come. Flee the wrath to come, and flee to to Jesus, the only one who can save you from your sin. Listen, it's time to stop trusting in your own righteousness and start trusting in the righteousness of the Holy One, Jesus and his perfect work on the cross for you. And if you'll do that, you put your trust in Jesus, you can stand in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God with full confidence knowing that your sin has been washed away. You've been made clean and you're a new creation in Christ and his Holy Spirit, that same Holy Ghost that did that holy thing in Mary could do a holy thing in you. Amen? And the Holy Spirit will live in you and you can be made holy and righteous in God's sight. And it's all because of Jesus. It's all because Jesus makes the unclean clean. And it's, 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 it's because of Jesus that we don't have to be separated from the presence of the Lord. It's because of Jesus that, 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 that we no longer have an inability to approach God in our sinful condition. We can draw near to him. We can cry out to him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. We no longer have to fear God in the same sense that he's going to strike us dead for daring to approach him in our unholiness. Yet the Bible does tell us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's not like he's any less dangerous than he ever was before. He's still God, right? Jesus still commands reverence and obedience, amen? And his holiness is still something to be respected and feared. In his book, The Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote about the children first hearing about Aslan, the lion. And they were unsure what to think about him. And, and so Lucy, she asked the question, she asks, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver answers, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Listen, Jesus is the king, I tell you. Come on, he's not safe, but he's good. Jesus is good. He said there's only one that's good, and that's God, and I'm telling you, Jesus is good. And because Jesus is good, and because the goodness of God, pastor, the goodness of God is what brings us to repentance, right? It's the goodness. He's so good. He's so good to do what he's done for us, to make a way where there's no way we could get to him on our own. He's made a way. And not only has he forgiven us of our sins when we put our trust in Jesus, not only is he good enough to wipe our slate clean, come on, he adopts us as as his own. Come on, he makes us ambassadors for him. He makes us co-heirs with Jesus Christ. How good is that? Come on, he's good. 
And that's why you can come to him today because he's good. He's good. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today because his holiness, now listen, I'm almost done. His holiness is the only hope for our unholiness. In a few moments, we're going to be partaking in holy communion. And yes, communion is holy. That means it's not something to be rushed through. It's not something to be taken lightly or for granted. It's holy. It's a holy moment. But before we share in this holy meal, I want you to turn with me to our very last scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23. The Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and after he had supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I want you to know that this is the portion of Scripture that is typically read or recited at the communion table. You've all heard it many times. But I want you to know it's pretty rare, pretty rare for anyone to go on to the next four verses of the same passage. But we're going to do that before we share in this holy communion. Look at verse 27. You there? Therefore, stop. (laughs) Whenever the Bible says therefore, it's talking about everything that was previously just said. Because of everything in those previous verses, because the bread represents the body of the Lord which was broken for you, and because the cup, the wine, represents his blood which was shed for you, therefore, whosoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord is unworthily, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and unhealthy among you and many die. You see, the Corinthians, they were treating holy communion as if it were just another common meal. Listen, it's not just another meal. It's not a common cup of juice and a piece of cracker. It's not a sanctified snack. That's not what it is. It's holy. It's holy even as Christ is holy. It's holy even as his body, the church, is holy. It's holy even as the Lord's body broken for you is holy and his blood shed for you is holy. This table that is set before us this morning is holy because it's set in honor of Christ. It is the absolute fulfillment of prophecy spoken of all throughout the Old Testament, fulfilled in the new in Jesus Christ, and we look forward to his coming, and we do this until he comes, so it encompasses all of his first coming and his second coming. It's holy. And it's a time for us to reflect on what Christ has done for us. And so each one of us ought to examine ourselves, examine our lives, Examine our attitudes about church and about, about worship, about everything as we eat the bread and drink the cup. And listen, I'm going to try and say this as, as gently as I can. 
Don't you dare take this in unbelief. Don't do it. Don't be irreverent about this holy meal which represents the body and blood of Jesus Christ. If you do that, then you're taking it in an unworthy manner and you're messing around with a dangerously holy thing. Don't do it. This table is for believers. This is the covenant meal for blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ. We are here to worship him. We are here to worship a holy God. This is part of our worship of him. So don't take it in unbelief, but listen, you don't have to leave here today without taking communion. You can take it. You can come to Christ today. You can choose to put your faith in the one who has saved you from your sins and paid the price, is able to forgive you and bring you into the presence of a holy God who will then take up residence in you. You can do that today and then you can take holy communion with the rest of God's holy church. I want you to take a minute to reflect on all of that in your own heart. Will you turn the lights down and have the worship team come up? And I'm going to ask Pastor Dave, before we, before we share in the communion meal, I'm going to ask Pastor Dave just to say a few things as we reflect on, on the word of God today. I ask the communion ministers, would you come forward? Amen.